AI is taking its next step, and this one's pretty crazy, and it has the potential to be very disruptive in a certain industry. Stick around and I'll tell you more. Hey everybody, it's Brian from A Life After Layoff, and today I wanna to talk to you about the new AI system by OpenAI called Sora. Now, if you've been following this channel, you know that I've been talking about the impact of AI and why I feel it could be very disruptive for most people on the planet. And it seems like every day there's another company announcing a layoff or a CEO saying that they're gonna be focusing more on AI in the future, and we all know what that means. And unfortunately, it does seem like people are starting to lose their job because of the impact of AI. But before he jumps on my throat, don't worry, it's not all gloom and doom. I do want to share my thoughts on where things are heading, especially with this latest system called Sora. But before we get into that, if you're interested in learning how to reclaim control and start to act like the CEO of your career and your job search, this is especially important with the rise in AI right now and where we're headed in the future, you want to sign up for my free newsletter because in it, I share concise, actionable tips on how to put yourself in the driver's seat in your career and as you're looking for new jobs so that you can have some degree of control in what's going on. Keep in mind, it's absolutely free. It's loaded with value and I'll leave a link in the comments so you can sign up easily. So if you're not familiar with OpenAI, they're the company behind ChatGPT, and they have released a new software technology called Sora. And the definition of Sora is an AI model that creates realistic and imaginative scenes from text instruction. So in other words, they're basically creating videos from AI. So they're taking ChatGPT prompts and they've combined it with a video generation system to create these AI driven videos. So I don't think this is actually released yet for you to play with yourself. It's in some sort of a beta, but they have given us a few different samples of what to expect. And I wanted to show you a few of these. Now, keeping in mind, this is completely generated by AI. So as you can see, all the different people walking, the complexity, the movement of the camera and how everybody is generated, it looks really realistic. So we've got a woman walking in Tokyo and then we've got it's kind of fun because you can actually see some of the uh, history. This is a, a woolly mammoths um, running around. So if you wonder what a woolly mammoth would look like, this is an AI generated version of it. And again, look at like the texture in the snow. Look at the uh, mountains, the um, the animations, you know, even how the feet meet the snow and how the snow reacts. I think it's really realistic. We also have a movie trailer for a, this is the prompt, was a movie trailer featuring adventures of a 30 year old spaceman wearing a red uh, wool knitted motorcycle helmet, blue sky, salt desert, and a cinematic style shot on 35 millimeter film. And you can see how it basically creates a scene. You know, imagine if you're trying to generate a movie, a sci-fi movie, you know, suddenly you can take a prompt and you can film it without even filming it. Um, so again, it's like the, the textures, the, the animations, the movements are really quite remarkable for, you know, for this new technology. Then drone shots. So you've got this uh, drone a view of waves against a rugged cliff on the Big Sur, uh, Gary Point Beach. I've never actually been to this beach before. So if you've actually been here before, does this actually look like it? But you can see the waves crashing. Now to me, the waves still look artificial. But nonetheless, water movement is a very difficult thing to do. There's so many different textures that need to be animated, but it, it still looks really quite remarkable. And it's just the, the panning motion, how everything is pulling in. You're not seeing too many artifacts. But um, nonetheless, it's, it's, uh, there's still, it's not perfect, but there's still some uh, really impressive footage here. Then you have this animated scene featuring a close-up of a fluffy monster kneeling beside a red, a melted red candle. It's realistic and it's supposed to focus on the texture. So if you look at the hair textures in particular, how the the uh, character is interacting, the animation movements. Now I'm thinking like Pixar, for example, how potentially this could be disruptive for you know if, if I'm Pixar, I'm looking at this saying like, what if I made a movie? There's probably let's, let's be real. There's probably not going to be too long in the future before a lot of the animated movies you're watching are going to be completely dictated or developed by AI. So the animation is really quite clever and it's it's on par with some of the major motion pictures I've seen. The next one we have here is a gorgeously rendered paper craft world of a coral reef with colorful fish and sea creatures. And so they're taking these prompts and turning it into kind of an artistic interpretation of a sea reef and you can see how it interprets that. Then we've got you've got a, a pigeon again just like the all the texture of the feathers and how it moves the realistic kind of twitching that birds tend to have 
And then we've got pirate ship, a close up of two pirate ships battling each other as they sail inside a cup of coffee. <laughs> so, you know, I'm thinking like television commercials, that sort of thing. Now, obviously this is going to look fake, but when you do animations or motion graphics, you know, this would be pretty remarkable, um, you know, pretty remarkable rendering if somebody were to try to do this in like After Effects or something like that. But there's also some things down here that are interesting. Like this is a scene um, from um, historical footage of California during the gold rush. And you can see how it even takes the tone of the film. It, it kind of looks like an old, uh, I don't know what film tone this would be, but it has a vintage quality to it. But it's kind of cool to see you know, how they render back in the gold rush, what it might've looked like. Now, there is some issues with the artifacting here. Like you got this weird horse thing right there. It doesn't have a head. And if you look right, look in this area right here, you'll see a horse disappear and you'll see some weird looking creature kind of pop out. So I think AI still has some issues with especially long footage, like footage from far away with walking. And I've noticed that with fingers, AI tends to, to struggle with fingers and appendages. Um, so it'll, they'll kind of look a little bit Martian. So it's almost like the AI is, at least in this version, is kind of, it's just like slightly off. It's almost like an alien world. Just like there's just some slightly unsettling component to it. But um, keep an eye out for right here. See how that disappeared right there? And then there's this creature that almost looks like a, I don't know, it looks like some sort of a creature that uh, that emerges from the water. Watch right here. See this? And then this weird creature like walking right there. Then you've also got, I think that there is like, what's this weird art? It's like a strange artifact right there. And you've got, um, like if we were to pause it, you've kind of got weird uh, like uh, animals that have two heads and things like that, that um, again, it, it kind of struggles with that, that type of footage. But nonetheless, it's really pretty impressive. And then we've got like a sound, little kind of little fun animations, um, dwarf in a sphere with a Zen garden creating patterns in the sand. And then human eyes, which are tend to be very difficult to reproduce. Um, but you can see the, the tones and the textures still look artificial to me, but you know, it's pretty good. I think even like in terms of like video game applications, I wonder how this will impact that. If you're a, if you're a game developer or a, an artist for a game, uh, I'm, I'm seeing this as a potential use case for game studios as well. And then we've got, I mean, this, this almost looks like a commercial a kangaroo um, doing dance moves. And then you've got um, people in Logos, Nigeria. And it's a shot with, they, they wanted to make it look like it was shot with a mobile phone on a cam, like a, a mobile phone camera. But you can see um, the, the, the renderings, like his eyes look strange there so it's not perfect but and you can see like the traffic kind of looks a little strange as well it's like moving uh, kind of choppy but you can see it's just the people look a little digitally rendered but honestly if you're looking at major motion pictures i see that anyway if you look at those like you obviously know when you're looking at a digitally recreated background but the the graphic designers and the motion uh, like the special effects people they also have um similar kind of unnatural movements if you look closely um, but you kind of get the, the idea. And as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, wow, this is like really disruptive because I, in my past, I'm actually a commercial photographer. And when I started to get a little concerned about where things were heading was with the mid journey, you know, you've got AI generated graphic design. So graphic designers are <laughs> beware. Um, you've also got like, look at, like, check this out. Like, look at the detail on that. And it's a, a scary monster holding a solo cup with one hand sensing movement through a trough and uh, agility, high dynamic range, a fluid sense of movement. And it, it's uh, pretty crazy. You just put these prompts in or still life. I mean, that's a, that's a AI generated image and it even has like depth of field and, you know, graphic design. So if I'm a graphic designer or a photographer, let me see if I can find a good photograph. I mean, that looks pretty realistic as far as a, a bunny is concerned. Like, look at that. I mean, that's an AI, a, a, a child with bright delivery uniform on. I mean, that looks like a photograph of a, a little girl. And I'm just thinking to myself, if I'm an ad agency, 
who can hire a commercial photographer. Like I would have to go, they would hire me. I would go out on site or on location and it would be a big production. You bring out lighting, you know, I charge my day rate plus all the editing fees and all that stuff. It would be a you know, fairly significant investment from a company. And, if, and that's just me doing it kind of at a smaller scale. But when you have these large commercial studios, you know, they're charging hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars for a photo shoot for a you know commercial like a product uh, a photo shoot. So, what's to say that they can't just feed the product into an AI prompt and then suddenly generate a very acceptable AI image? So, if I'm a commercial photographer, I'm now starting to be pretty worried. But as you go through and I mean, look at the like spaghetti, I mean, the detail in that, like if I'm a, if I'm a company that's um, a pasta company, you know, I mean, or a restaurant or something like, look at the detail in that where, um, you know, you could hire that instead of having to get a, a studio and again, all the post-production and all that stuff, maybe just one more, but you can just see the detail of uh, photorealistic uh, imaging coming out of mid journey and then. You know, it's like, uh, this looks like almost like a Coca-Cola commercial or something. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is, is that the AI, like where is AI going with, in, in particular, in the, let's just use the context of the, the creative industry. We've got photographers, we've got um, all of the people who are associated with, you know, post-production, you've got makeup artists, you've got the cinematographers, graphic designers, you've got um, special effects people, you've got like on a film crew, you've got the um, gaffers and the lighting people and the sound design, the set design, the um, makeup artists, the the um, wardrobe, you know, the scouting and location people. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of different people on a crew, especially if you go to a movie. Like we were in, my wife and I were in New Orleans last year and we, we happened to across, they were filming, um, I think it was called Your Honor. It was with Brian Cranston. It's that that new show that's that's out. This is like I think it's in the second season, but they were filming just a single scene in New Orleans, and they had the entire like two or three blocks right off of um, Bourbon Street all blocked off. You couldn't get through. They had hundreds of crew people walking around. They had this massive amount of equipment, and it was just to film a couple of scenes that they probably would set that up, then set this up, and then they would probably only be spending like, actual screen time would probably be five minutes total but the amount of production that went into it was just staggering if you're somebody like netflix or amazon or you know like disney or somebody else who is creating a lot of these shows and let's face it a lot of them are garbage but the production values are so high on them and if you're you can you know save some money significant money on production cost just think of I mean, surely these studios will be looking at this technology very, very closely. And that's kind of where it leads into, you know, is this already happening? And well, the fact is, is that Sora was only released as I record this, so like only like two or three weeks ago, but we already have major studios putting a, a hold on ex plans to expand and you know, Taylor Perry, whatever you know, your opinion is on him, but he, nonetheless, he's a major player in in Hollywood, and he has put the um, a halt on an $800 million uh, studio expansion after seeing this Sora in action. And he says, these jobs are going to be lost. And as you start to go through and look at the, the plans he had, he was going to add 12 sound stages into a 330 acre property. And he is putting those ambitious plans on hold thanks to rapid developments he's seeing in the realm of artificial intelligence. And it's only been off for a few weeks and already it's pausing an $800 million expansion. And just think of all the jobs that are associated with that, all the people who are involved in the construction of it, the building of it, the maintenance of it, the day-to-day -day operation, plus all the talent, the crew, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And he says, being told that it can do all these things is one thing, but actually seeing the capabilities was mind blowing, he said in an interview, noting that his production crews might not have to travel to locations or build sets without the assistance, uh, with the assistance of the technology. Now, keeping in mind, you know, when you send a, a film crew off to a certain location, especially a small town, maybe that they're filming on location, just think of what that does to that local economy for that period of time. It can really improve, you know, the, all the hotels, the the, the uh, restaurants, uh, all of the associated you know support that goes into hosting a film crew in a small town. It could be a real boon to their you know, economy. And now, if they're pulling it out, they're not going to be doing this anymore. You know, that can be a major impact there, and then this, the film studio is going to save tons of money as well. 
But he says, as a business owner, Perry sees the opportunity in developments, but as an employer and as a filmmaker, he wants to raise the alarm. And he says that um, there, it, there's got to be some sort of regulation in order to protect us. If not, I just don't see how we will survive. The question was asked is, what was the most particularly shocking capability that I had? And he says, I no longer will have to travel to locations. If I wanted to be in snow in Colorado, it's text. If I want to write a scene on the moon, it's text. And AI can generate it like it's nothing. If I want to put two people in a living room in the mountains, I don't have to build a set in the mountains. I can just, I don't have to put it on my lot, uh, set on my lot. I can sit on a computer and do it in the matter of minutes. And it's really quite crazy. You know, he's again, he's calling out, including actors' grips, electric transportation, sound, editors, all of this stuff. I think it's going to touch every corner of the industry. And he even said, I've already just used AI in two films where it kept me out of makeup for hours. He basically aged himself. I was able to use this technology to avoid having to sit there through hours of aging makeup. So you've got makeup artists that are directly being impacted by this. And this is not just made up stuff. This is real a real film studio saying that they're eliminating jobs. It doesn't mean that they're laying somebody off per se, but they're not certainly not hiring a person. And that's a direct impact to the number of jobs that are going to be available. So this is really happening as much as I know some people don't want to believe that it is happening. But if you think about it, how it even cascades beyond that, and he's even saying it right here, it's, it's not just our industry, but it's every industry that AI will be affecting from accountants to architects. If you look across the world, at how quickly it's changing. I hope there's a whole new government approach because this is not going to be sustainable. There really needs to be some look at AI and how it's being rolled out because right now it feels like it's just the Wild West. But when we go and we look at major companies that are re-emphasizing this AI, it's not slowing down. Here we've got yeah, so Apple, Apple uh, this morning officially canceled work on a self-driving electric car. Jeff Williams, the company's chief operating officer, and Kevin Lynch, the company's vice president of technology, uh, who was foremost in charge of the car project, announced to the team, it's about 2,000 people, that the project, called Titan internally, is winding down. There will be layoffs of some hardware people. Hardware people will have the opportunity to apply to other teams. Other people working on the project are being shifted to Apple's AI and machine learning division to work on generative AI products, a key future component of the company. There will well, some, there will some, there will be some people move to the Vision Pro uh, as well, with that focus on spatial computing. Uh, but so we can clearly see that Apple, among others, is doubling down on their investment in AI as well. So AI is here to stay. And when people say, oh, it's not going to happen to me, they can't possibly replace my job. I know like software developers I've kind of talked about in the past, and I get a lot of software developers come in and say, well, you don't know what you're talking about. And the reality is, is that companies are looking at your jobs. They're looking at every type of job, and they're looking for the technologies that they can invest in in order to eliminate or reduce the reliance on that certain amount of labor or staff, especially stuff that's repetitive. And the speed at which it is developing and evolving is what is most shocking to me. Because essentially, they started work on it in 2016, they published a research paper in 2019, and then the first version of OpenAI's ChatGPT was announced November 30th of 2022. So we have only been in this about a year and a few months, you know, maybe almost a year and not even a year and a half. And since then, the ecosystem as a result of this has absolutely exploded. In fact, it's saying here that ChatGPT reached 100 million users faster than even TikTok, which had made the milestone in nine months, Instagram, which had made it in two and a half years. So absolutely exploding onto the scene. And shortly thereafter, Microsoft announces a feature coming to Bing and everybody now is developing their own AI technology. In fact, I would press you to go and look at a major company who offers, a, especially in the software as a service, for anybody that is not using AI in some le on some level, whether it's a plugin, whether it's some sort of, it's almost like they're just throwing the kitchen sink at it and seeing what happens. But I think we're going to continue to see it evolve very quickly. Since then, AI or OpenAI has, has released ChatGPT4. Um, they also announced, uh, I think they have an, even a more current version than that, that has been out even more recently. But it's it's just evolving so quickly, and at the speed at which it's evolving, it's <laughs> there is a very real concern about where are we heading in the future with this. And again, if you don't think that companies are looking at your jobs and looking at how they can disrupt their their businesses with the use of AI, then I think you're being extremely naive right now. And I don't care how irreplaceable you think you are, 
the fact of the matter is, is that companies are looking at it and, and they're probably going to be willing to take a certain hit on productivity based on kind of making the, the switch over. I, I just believe that when you look at these companies who lay off all of the staff and then they come out you know, six months later and announce record profits, even though there's a hiccup in the staffing, we, they've just proven that they're willing to look at taking those lumps as they roll out this technology. And I think we can't be too cautious about this and looking at it from a, a CEO's lens. If you look at like a SWOT analysis, we're looking at what the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are in our organizations. And we should be treating ourselves like the, the CEO of our career. We should also be doing a SWOT analysis on our career. What are the opportunities and what are the threats? AI could be a big threat, but it could also be a big opportunity if you really learn how to leverage the technology to make yourself even more indispensable or to try to find a position that maybe doesn't have as much exposure to AI. But I think it's going to get harder and harder to find. But as we look at the explosion of chat GPT and AI related search terms over the course of this is the past five years, you can see that it was implemented right here at this point. Um, November of 2022, and then the search terms go up to a near 100% of popularity. In fact, it absolutely spiked. Uh, 100 is the highest level of popular interest over time. So you can see it was almost next to nothing. It was only a 10% or however they want to call it, but then it goes all the way up to um, nearly 100% here, and it's still sky high. And the same thing goes for ChatGPT. If you were to look, click on that and do a, and extrapolate that out, it's the same exact thing. We're seeing an absolute skyrocketing of people showing an interest in this technology. And as we look at the AI generative map, Sequoia has published, this is the different technologies that right now that are being developed or have been a, a launched as part of version three of the generative AI marketplace. So you can see all of the different companies that are investing in AI technologies and it goes by consumer, it goes by gaming, music, avatars, education, uh, healthcare, sales, design, software engineering and coding, um, productivity, customer support, automation, marketing, financial services, legal. You've got um, search, search results, which has ChatGPT down here, but you've also got Google showing up. Um, you've got voice, voiceover, video creation and editing. 3D, image creation, editing, browsers. You've got just every single industry, it seems like, is going to be affected by this. And I think it's time to realistically look at your job type and your industry and ask the question of, am I being realistic here about what threat or what exposure I have to AI in my day to day? And more importantly, how I can position myself going forward. And I'll be talking more about how you can do that in future videos. So I know the whole topic of AI can be kind of scary, it's really because we don't know what's happening or what's going on in the future, how things are going to evolve. But I do think we need to be realistic, especially at the speed at which things are evolving. And so what that means for me is the CEO of my career, I'm looking around at all the potential threats in my industry or what my company is doing and trying to be one step ahead. Now, it might mean pivoting into an entirely different career path or doubling down on my skills in my current job. And here's a little hint. Maybe you want to double down on your skill using AI because oftentimes the people who are retaining their jobs are the people who are actually great at using AI to do their jobs even better. But like any disruptive technology, we will all adapt and learn how to live in this new world because it's not going anywhere. But if you find yourself struggling and you're ready to make that change, that's actually what I specialize in. I've got a website called alifeafterlayoff.com. It's loaded with tips and tricks, all from an insider's perspective. And I share my deepest and most intimate knowledge in the form of some training courses. The first one is called Resume Rocket Fuel. You have to learn how to write a resume in order to market yourself to those new employers. And resume writing is a critical skill that everybody should acquire. So I created a course called Resume Rocket Fuel, which I walk you through step-by-step -step on how to create a resume from a recruiter's perspective. And I actually write my own and you can follow along with the template I provide. It's a really robust resource. But once you get your foot in the door, it's up to you to market yourself effectively through each stage of the interview process. And that's exactly where the ultimate job seeker bootcamp comes in. We go through each round, giving you tips, techniques, and strategies so that ultimately we can get you to the job offer and make sure that you don't leave a dime on the table. And that alone is worth the price of admission because oftentimes people undervalue themselves and leave a lot of money on the table and we'll make sure that you don't do that. And if you want to skip the recruiter altogether, who knows, maybe at some point in time, it'll be an AI chatbot that you're talking to in your first round of interviewing. 
then you want to learn how to leverage the power of targeted networking. And that's exactly where unlocking LinkedIn comes in. I've created a course that teaches you how to use LinkedIn to your advantage as a job seeker so that you can get past the recruiter and unlock the hidden job market. Anyway, hopefully this video was insightful for you. There's a lot of things happening in the world of work, and I'm going to keep a pulse on it, especially in regards to AI. Appreciate you watching. We'll see you on the next one.